so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is Gülşen Taşkın. I am from Istanbul Technical University, Turkey. I am also working for IEEE GRSS, IIDF Image and Signal Processing uh, Working Group. I am very happy to host this webinar, which is a part of webinar series on women in geoscience and remote sensing. Uh, this webinar is or jointly organized by IEEE, uh, GRSS, IDEA, and IADF. Uh, one of the aim of these webinars is to connect with female researchers from diverse regions globally to learn about their uh, research, enhance our knowledge, and most importantly, hear about their success and challenges encountered throughout their career uh, development. In addition to webinars, uh, we intend uh, to arrange various activities, including workshops, joint research project programs, and special issues in uh, selected IEEE journals. Our emphasis in these act initiatives is not only on, on highlighting women's presence in uh, these domains, but also on demonstrating their effectiveness. We believe that this is particularly valuable in inspiring and motivating young female researchers in geoscience and remote sensing. As you may know, today is International Women's Day. Uh, it is very appropriate, right, for this webinar to be held today. <laughs> so, what, a, what a coincidence. Yeah, what a coincidence. Uh, so wishing everyone here a happy International Women's Day. So in this sense, I would like to express my uh, gratitude to Dr. Evelina Rapnik from Laboratory on Geographic Information Science at French National Institute of Geographic and for his information on behalf of IDEA and IADF for her valuable contribution to this event. Today, uh, we will focus on a very interesting topic, uh, which includes processing of historical photography, along with three case studies on landslide, earthquake, and glacier volume mapping. Before handing over the floor to Evelina, I would like to provide a brief introduction to her. Evelina Rapnik was awarded a PhD in photogrammetry from Vienna University of Technology in 2015. Since 2017, she has held a research position at the Geographic and First uh, at the Laboratory on Geographic Information Science at the French uh, National Institute of Geographic and Forest Information. She is also an associate researcher at the Paris uh, Institute of Earth Physics. Evelina serves as the editor-in-chief of the French Journal of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing and co-chair of the ISPS Working Group on Image Orientation and Sensor Fusion. Her research interests are in pose estimation and image-based 3D reconstruction. She advocates for open resource solution in photogrammetry as an active member of the open source MiCMAC uh, project. So before starting, I would like to remind you that you can ask your questions using chat box during the webinar, or you may want to ask your questions by unmuting yourself at the end of the presentation. So we will have time to discuss all of these questions at the end of the webinar. So with that, I would like to give you the floor, Evelina. Uh, thank you so much, Kusam. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, first question, can you see my mouse, by the way, on the screen? Just to know what they're um, what yes, I'm I can. Yes, yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thanks for the invitation. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, pleasure to talk about photogrammetry. Uh, the topic is photogrammetry with historical photography. What I mean by historical is basically taken with uh, analog cameras, and it's everything but an exhaustive talk on historical photography. It just uh, presents my experiences with historical photography. So take it please into account that it's a, it's, it's a narrow minded view of what is uh, historical photogra photography. Uh, another important piece of information is that this uh, everything I'll be presenting today are results of collaborations that I had had the chance to have had the chance to uh, carry out with uh, my students, my former and current colleagues, uh, Lurin Zank, a former PhD student, a current postdoc, Benjamin Lauer from uh, IPGP, former PhD student, Sajid Gouffard, a former colleague and current collaborator, and Marc Perrault-Seligny, my, my colleague. So, Everything I'm talking about, it's a collaboration involving many people. It's not uh, me that uh, did it all. Uh, so let's get started. 
the talk is divided into uh, two parts. I will first talk about uh, aerial historical imagery and our approaches to processing such imagery. And then I will move on to this uh, very exotic uh, corona uh, keyhole satellite imager. So I packed this presentation, I think, too much. So hopefully I'm not speaking too fast just to make it in time. By the way, do we have a do we have a strict uh, end of this talk or? Well, we don't have. Okay, so, okay, oh, that's good. Um, so first of all, why are we interested in uh, historical images? Uh, but the very trivial answer is it's because there it exists and there's many historical images out there. I'm showing you here a table um, summarizing uh, historical image collections in Europe. It's a result of a poll that was uh, co-organized by my colleagues, by the way. Uh, I uh, invite you to uh, go through this publication full of interesting stats. Uh, so you, you can see that just in Europe, we have around 50 million uh, images, aerial images, historical images. Not all of them are digitized, but many are, and many of them are available online, uh, even uh, on, in open access. Uh, another reason why it's so interesting, it's because often it spans a century. So here on that map, you can see, uh, right, somebody's drawing on the screen. Do we have an uninvited guest? Yes, to... somebody. Yeah. I cannot find out. So okay, I think I can I should be able to stop. <laughs> uh okay. What well, do we have to uh I, I can just think... go ahead. I think it's wrongly. Right, okay. Uh so second reason uh is that there's uh, it, this spans a century. So in the red uh, bars uh, correspond to uh, across how many years a country was uh, performing image collection. So uh, if the bar is full, it means 100 years. So there are some countries in Europe that were actually collecting throughout the entire century and some not. The green band corresponds to the amount of uh, images that were digitized. So some countries managed to digitize it all, or some countries is still underway, but the collections are immense and they are uh, to be used. Second of all, these acquisitions were often uh, stereo photogrammetric acquisitions, which means we can do 3D mapping, okay? And they have pretty good uh, spatial resolution. Well, they vary between five centimeters and five meters. Majority of them are under a meter, uh, which allows us to create nice surfaces uh, with uh, a, lot of, a lot of detail. Finally, these acquisitions were not one shot acquisitions, but they were uh, captured across, they were repetitively captured. So we have a nice temporal frequency, which means we there's a lot of potential for change detection to see how the surface evolves over time. And so here you can see a port in the south of southern of France captured in 54 and 2014. Now, if we want to compare these two, perform some uh, evolution analysis, there are two key ingredients that we have to uh, keep in mind and uh, attack, let's say. First, calibration. Second, co-registration. So what I mean by calibration, I mean recovering the geometry of the camera, focal length, principal point, and the position and rotation of the camera. Like within some arbitrary coordinate frame, co-registration is bringing arbitrary coordinate frames to one common frame. So here we have uh, 55, uh, Epoch 54 on the left, Epoch 2014 on the right. Yeah, what we want is what we have in the middle, two images or orthophotos that perfectly overlap so that we, if we pick, pick an X, Y coordinate and we trace this coordinate across our time series of images, we are certain that this X, Y does not change from image to image. And so this is the uh, prerequisite for any uh, time series analysis. So how do we go about that? Uh, this, the pipeline is, uh, is, is uh, known. It's a structure for motion, which is basically feature extraction and post estimation here. I interchange these terms, post estimation, calibration. They mean more or less the same. Post estimation for me, it's estimating internal, external parameters of a camera. And from structure for motion, that is an arbitrary reconstruction, a reconstruction within our, in an arbitrary frame, we georeference our results to a common frame. Now with historical images, the problem is that already at the beginning of the pipeline, 
we are in trouble because the feature, feature extraction does not work. And here you can see some uh, features between uh, extracted with uh, state of the art, at least at that time, uh, at the time of uh, this research, uh, state of the art feature extractors, uh, handcrafted, sift, sift and uh, deep learning based to super glue. The points are not at all corresponding. Okay, so this is a bottleneck that has to be addressed. Now, let's assume that everything goes well. We are able to calibrate our cameras and co register them perfectly. Now, if we generate the DSMs from either of the epochs, right? So we have one DSM here, another here, and we do a difference between them. If all goes well, we're supposed to see an image that is globally flat. What I mean by flat is that the globally the amplitude will be zero, right? We have non-zero values only there where the change happens. So it's green or red, and it corresponds to what maybe vegetation growth or shrinkage or new built-up areas and so on and so forth. This is definitely not what we see if we use historical images and we don't take special precautions. Uh, this is the, the typical result. So it's a DOD that is affected by a uh, additional signal that precludes the signal that actually interests us, which is the change in the scene, the evolution of the scene. And you may be familiar with this, uh, with this uh, dome effect, or banana effect from uh, drone imagery, from UAV mapping, especially UAV mapping with linear acquisitions because of the arising correlations between external parameters and internal parameters of the camera, we often see this uh, systematic error in, in 3D. So something that has to be again addressed if we want to do change detection. What happens, uh, what has been done in the literature, with manual, with, to, what, to find common points between inter epochs, you can always resort to manual uh, control point selection. It's laborious, fine, it takes time, fine, but at least it's very robust, huh? something you can trust. Uh, you can use SIFT, and it's, sometimes SIFT works, but not always. It's only partially invariant to time. So if the if the time gap, time gap becomes too large and the scene changes too much, SIFT will definitely not work. And on our case with 50 year uh, time gap, it did not work. You may have some metadata uh, accompanied with your historical images, uh, like flight lines, like rough geolocalization of your perspective centers. And you could exploit that to try to find automatic ground control points with existing orthophotos if you have them. But again, this requires some a priori inputs that you not always have, that is not always available. And finally, uh, what I'll talk in the uh, coming slides, it's the approach that we developed and implemented in Micmac within the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Lulin Zhang and approach that we refer to as course, course to precise. Uh, so let's, let's look at the uh, first, let's see what drove us to come up with the approach. What were the uh, key uh, observations? The goal was to have an automated and precise co-registration of multi-epoch images. And our uh, requirement was not to have any a priori. Look, the, only a priori the only input information that we had and we expected to have was the approximate focal length and the size of the image. That's it. The bottom leg, as I explained just before, is finding corresponding points between images inter-epoch. Inter-epoch, yeah, so two different epochs, not within, not intra, but inter-epoch. And so something we've observed is that uh, obviously the state-of-the-art algorithms work within one epoch, right? So if we take images from 1954 and we just process that uh, that epoch, we will have we will obtain a surface model that is maybe not beautiful, but we will we will have a result. And if we do the same for another epoch over the same area, well, the images are drastically different. They don't resemble, well, the resemblance is very uh, low, let's say, but we noticed that actually the DSMs have not changed so much. So they're not so, so much susceptible, obviously they changed a bit, but visually they, they resemble each other more. So we thought, why not extract features, multi-epoch features between the DSMs, the surfaces? And the advantage of using surfaces is also that we not only have 2D points that have coordinates in the images, but we have 3D points, right? Because the, the DSM also have the third coordinate. So we can use these points to perform 3D similarity co-registration, co 3D similarity transformation to co-register to two epochs. 
And it did work, as we suspected. It did work. Here you have you have, an, you have a result, common points between DSMs. Now the problem is, as you can observe, is that DSMs are noisy, especially for historical images because of poor contrast, because of noisy, uh, because of the amount of noise in the images. The localization of your points is very poor, which uh, obviously translates to rough results, or like to code registration that is not good enough. But it's fine with that. Uh, we can we can use this as an a priori to actually, in the next step, guide our second iteration of feature extraction, where we extract type points in the RGB images. So RGB image, images are famously well, they are precise, huh? That's, well, at least compared to the DSMs. And by using by exploiting the 3D, we are able to predict the position of potential uh, matching points. So we no longer have to match between all the possible images that we have in the epochs. No, we, we have a prediction and a point in uh, epoch one can be directly predicted as a point in an epoch two, right? with a little bit of uh, uncertainty, obviously, because our core registration is not right. right? Let's look again at this pipeline. Uh, let's go through it again uh, using a, uh, a, a toy pipeline. Uh, so you get a better understanding of uh, what I mean. So again, we have two epochs. It can be actually extended to any number of epochs. For the simplicity of this presentation, I'm talking about two epochs. Epoch one, epoch two. We apply standard uh, state-of-the-art structure for motion to, obtain, to orientate our images within epoch one within epoch two, and we extract surfaces for either of the epochs, okay? And what we do then, we, ap we apply, we search for common points in the DSMs. Once we have these points, they are in our 3D points, we have corresponding two sets of corresponding points in two epochs that have 3D coordinates. We compute seven parameter transformation that brings two epochs to one coordinate frame. Or we may choose epoch one to be master and move epoch two to epoch one or the other way around, doesn't matter. It's still coarse. There are, there are some errors, but it's, it's good enough for our next stage. And then we leverage that 3D information to find very precise matches in our RGB images, high resolution and high contrasting uh, with perfect texture uh, RGB images. With the precise matches, we uh, throw everything to a self-calibrating bundle adjustment, right? So we estimate all the parameters of the cameras, internal, external, and we obtained we obtain refined cameras with which we can calculate refined surfaces. The pipeline is modular. Uh, we designed it to be modular, given the uh, the speed of uh, uh, algorithmic development in the computer vision communities, the fact that feature extractors every new year with every CDPR conference, there's a new feature extractor, and it's a better than the one from the year before. We want it to be, uh, we want to be able to plug uh, different feature extractors and maintain our pipeline as the time goes. Um, caveat, as you may know, uh, deep learning based feature extractors are uh, trained on small images because of the uh, GPU memory resources, right? So if you take a big image, if you take a big big DSM that has 10,000 by 10,000 pixels and you just uh, feed it like that to a feature extractor that is based on deep learning, your big image will be uh, down sampled to a small images, image, which will impact the localization procedure of your points. So then, yeah, naturally also, impacts your estimation of uh, your, your, your bundle adjustment estimation of your parameters. So in order to circumvent that, what we did, we tile the DSM to, uh, we, we, we create patches that are more or less of the same size as the images that were used to train our deep learning uh, feature extractors. And we run it patch per patch. That's the first thing. Another caveat, deep learning based feature extractors are not rotation invariant. Okay, so we had to, well, we have to always test for hypothesis. So one of the images, let's say, for instance, that the top image would be rotated four times and features would be computed for the four rotation. And then the rotation, one rotation would be retained. It's the rotation that has uh, the highest number of inline matches. And when I say inline matches, I mean matches that are 
coherent with our uh, mathematical model, which is a 3D similarity transformation between the two epochs. Uh, right. Yeah, so this is maybe uh, maybe it became clear now how we actually leverage the 3D information to uh, guide our feature matches. So let's say this is we have one image, we pick a patch. If we use a deep learning based uh, feature extraction, we project this patch to the ground, we back project it to another image, right? So uh, once it's back projected, we resample the violet uh, area into the geometry of the first master image. And such, we feed it to a deep learning, uh, uh, deep learning based feature extractor like Superglue, for instance. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, let's move on to real case studies, which is probably more interesting for uh, for the audience. Uh, we tested the pipeline across varied uh, real case studies. I'll present some of them uh, now, not I think all. Uh, let's start with the COPE earthquake. Uh, so I like this data set a lot because it's very, uh, it's easy to process. It's, it's a photogrammetric, a proper photogrammetric flight with nice overlap along the flight, with nice overlap across the flight. The, time difference between the two acquisition is not so much. It's only four years, right? So 91, 95, in between, I think 93, I believe, was the, uh, the COPE earthquake. And we apply our pipeline. So we first calculate the DSM features. That works beautifully. We leverage the 3D to find the precise features. That works beautifully. We have features that are nicely distributed, are dense, and then, with the multi-epoch features and features that are were extracted within the epoch, so features 90 from 91 and features within the epoch of 95, we run a self-calibrating bundle adjustment, right? So we re-estimate focal length, principal point, distortion coefficients, external orientations. At the, at the end, uh, we compute the surfaces, we rectify our images, using the surface. So we create orthophotos and these orthophotos, because they were, because our, our orientations, our calibrations were coherent across the epochs, our orthophotos are perfectly overlapping, right? So if there was no change uh, between the two epochs, uh, the, the images would be uh, more or less exactly the same. Probably maybe the images were taken at a different time of the day. So there would be some illumination differences, but the scene would not change. But we know that the scene changed. So now we want to detect what was the, displacement, the displacement. So what we do is we apply uh, semi-global dense matching, but not in one direction, which you do if you want to extract surface. We do it along two directions, right? We do it along X and Y. And then at the end, we have dense displacement maps, which are the ground displacements. And by the way, if you're interested uh, by uh, this method, I, I suggest you look up this paper and also at the end, I will be giving you uh, uh, links towards uh, tutorials, Jupyter tutorials on how to get your hands on, uh, on this pipeline in Micmac. Uh, so how to validate our, uh, our pipeline for that particular case, uh, we had access to this ground truth uh, displacement map. Uh, I'm not sure how it was generated. Uh, the bold uh, continuous line is the fault, right? So this is where the two tectonic plates uh, meet and we have uh, vectors that indicate the direction of the movement. And here is what we found. So after the core registration, obviously we can't see anything. The systematic errors are still there. So uh, this, our signal we search for is, is uh, occluded. But uh, after a precise matching, and this is a map in one direction, because normally you have two maps, you have a map along X and a, a map along Y. So this is a displacement map along a Y. And you can nicely see that actually at the fault, uh, you, can, you can identify the fault, right? So where the, uh, where the, movement, uh, where the movement happened, or well, at least our, our colleagues, uh, our colleagues, uh, our uh, geologists were, were satisfied with that result. Now we tried different combinations with different feature structure just to see whether the pipeline is sensitive to uh, the kind of features. In that case, it wasn't. Uh, the, the results were uh, consist, consistent uh, across uh, different combination of um, features. 
Alberona, this is a challenging case. It's a very different uh, scenario. And why is it challenging? Because first of all, for several reasons, first of all, we have very few images. So we uh, don't like that. Photogrammetrists don't like to have few images, especially if you have to estimate uh, camera calibrations. Huh? Bundle block adjustment work beautifully if you have nice overlaps, many, uh, uh, many axes, et cetera, et cetera. But so here we have only a few images. And there's another problem is that the images from, 90, from, from 54, they were not digitized from the negatives. They were digitized from uh, developed images. So we have an, another layer of uh, deformation that was introduced to the images uh, caused by the fact that the images were recorded on a uh, paper. Uh, finally, a 50 year time gap, which uh, yeah, makes it uh, difficult as well. So our friends from uh, CNR Chenner, uh, in Italy were interested in this particular landslide. Uh, up until uh, that time, they would identify their only means to uh, map this landslide was to do it in uh, planimetry in X and Y, and they would delineate it uh, using uh, orthophotos. So they were very interested to uh, see what our method can do with it because they could finally retrieve the third, uh, the third component, the 3D, true 3D, uh, which could feed their models and improve their models and understand the phenomena uh, better. Grand Truth uh, delineated again by our uh, friend geologists and our results. Well, again, Rafco Rafco registration, well, you can't uh, see too much, although, yeah, the source, the source of the landslide is uh, uh, visible, but we can't really see the accumulation zone, zone. And after the precise matching, well, they could indeed identify as well. Uh, the accumulation, so where the uh, uh, where the uh, sand, I believe, uh, or the soil accumulated uh, while falling uh, the slope. You may notice that the results are not as beautiful as in the previous example. There are some systematic errors on the borders, and this is because of the uh, the quality of our fifty four images, which were. Uh, well, I didn't mention that, but they also had a lot of scratches. The the contrast was the contrast was poor. Uh, the images had uh, per image calibrations. They didn't have a shared calibration, and because we had few images, we couldn't couldn't really free all these parameters. Uh, but still, our colleagues from our, our colleagues from uh, our Italian colleagues were were happy to to really have this kind of result. Uh, same as before, we did uh, different combinations and we re of different of different feature extractor act extractors, and we realized that actually uh, the method can be sensitive to which feature extractor you use. So not they all they all deliver different results, and only one is acceptable where we have globally uh, zero uh, displacements around the landslide. Right? Otherwise, we have always some systematic error that uh, uh, surrounds uh, the last slide of interest. Uh, I'm going to show uh, this example because well, I find it very interesting because we're mixing satellite images with uh, historical images. So why is it interesting? And it's because satellite images, uh, modern satellite images, they come with uh, georeferencing, precise georeferencing. So it makes sense to orientate historical images directly with satellite images. Um, the historical images are, uh, it's a photogrammetric acquisition, again, a nice data set to process from 71. The time gap is very different, but as you will see, uh, we managed to uh, obtain quite satisfying results. Uh, so these are the DODs, huh? so the differences between the DSMs. You can see that there's a patch in the middle. This patch is uh, because of the clouds. Yeah? You have some clouds and you have uh, shadows of the clouds. We had to uh, mask it out from processing. And yeah, so uh, the results uh, after precise matching uh, nicely points to areas that change. Huh? If we look at this uh, vegetated areas, so we can uh, delineate the, I'm not sure if it's shrinkage or uh, growth of, of the forest. Uh, yeah, that's a satisfying result. And finally, uh, last example for the historical aerial images is the glacier. It's, uh, it's also untypical. That's why I decided to show it. We, uh, we don't have multi-epoch images here. We have uh, one epoch uh, acquisition. 
but it's challenging because it uh, flies over a glacier where the uh, images are, uh, first of all, saturated, and second of all, uh, because of that, there's uh, very low contrast, a uh, few features uh, to link the consecutive images. So we don't have the 3D, but we, uh, we, tr we tried to employ the same reasoning, the same kind of reasoning. We thought, well, we are in an aerial case, uh, which means that we can assume that the consecutive images are probably related, or we, they are vaguely related by uh, a simple transformation, which is a 2D transformation. And the advantage of using a 2D transformation to relate two consecutive images is that yeah, it has very few parameters. With two points, we are capable of estimating these uh, these transformations. And then, once this transformation is known, we can use it to uh, guide our feature extraction uh, or dense feature extraction. So, if you run obviously state of the art uh, uh, feature extractors, well, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work. And then, what we did is. We did it in a semi-automated way. We identified manually two points between two consecutive images. We calculated a 2D semi transformation. And then automatically from that point on, we extracted the dense feature points, imposing that our feature points have to follow this mathematical uh, transformation, uh, 2D transformation between uh, the frames. And this is what we obtained. So that's, uh, yeah, another, I think, interesting example of how a priori knowledge can uh, uh, enhance uh, the feature extraction. Okay, so let's uh, take away. Uh, so one of the reasons that the historical images, well, there are many historical images, but I, I think they are still underexploited in, to a large extent. It's uh, one of the reasons because uh, there's uh, there's lack of uh, processing uh, procedures that are automated or that work on a large uh, variety of different configurations. And yeah, maybe there's a pipeline that works on this configuration and that configuration, but there's nothing that is uh, a, would be universal, let's say. Uh, but to, to summarize the challenges that we, that, that uh, analog images pose is uh, come from like the inherent uh, characteristics of, of the data. Uh, which is uh, what the images are archi archived and digitized, which introduces uh, non-trivial uh, camera camera models, camera models, camera distortions, and I already mentioned it briefly. Often we have to estimate camera calibration per image because of the fact that um, images are scanned independently. So obviously, uh, independent per image uh, distortions are introduced during the scanning, for instance. Uh, the uh, images are often of low contrast, have noise again due to the scanning. And the second problem that uh, analog images uh, one has to deal with when, when processing analog images, yes, is obviously the diachronism. So the fact that the scene evolves, and this uh, this uh, be because of that we have low low repeatability of points. There are very few few features. And the localization is also poor because just even if points resemble themselves in the images and they are found by a feature extractor, it does not necessarily mean that in 3D, this point has not moved over the 50 years. So like, we're making assumption that it doesn't, but not, that's not necessarily the case. And yeah, all that contributes to a uh, lack, uh, lack of robustness uh, when extracting features on uh, analog images. Yeah, good news is that we've observed that the 3D um, Geometry of the scene is much less susceptible to time, and we can uh, use that to uh, roughly align multi epoch images and also reduce a lot the complexity of uh, feature extraction. And, and secondly, we can use that to guide our uh, uh, precise match extraction in uh, RGB images. So. But once you have features that you trust that are reliable, Bundle adjustment will do the rest. Huh? You have you can trust in bundle adjustment that is capable of finding the optimal camera calibrations for for your images. And this is a must if you're interested in mapping or change detection with uh, historical images. So yeah, don't underestimate uh, how important camera calibration is. This is the lesson I'm I want to uh, give you. 
finally, if, uh, if you don't have stereo acquisitions or you only work with uh, a single epoch and uh, you're in an aerial case, you're struggling to find feature points, don't hesitate to uh, incorporate other a priori to, uh, to simplify the problems like we did with the 2D simulated transformation on the uh, glacier uh, flight. Okay, so here are the tutorials if you're interested to uh, try out the uh, historical pipeline in Micmac, or if you're interested in processing of historical images, of, sorry, satellite images, uh, go ahead. These are tutorials uh, in Jupyter uh, that install Micmac, uh, download the data. They are um, certainly a good point to start if you want to uh, get familiar with, uh, with Micmac. Okay, so finally, uh, Corona, this exotic uh, sensor that I had the chance to work with, uh, Corona KH, KH stands for keyhole, so keyhole. You look through the keyhole to see what's on the other side of the door. So it's actually a camera that was uh, created to uh, survey, to do surveillance, photo, photo reconnaissance in, uh, behind uh, the Iron Curtain. Uh, and as Wikipedia says, it was triggered by the uh, Sputnik crisis at the end of, uh, at the, end of the 50s. Uh, it's an ingenious camera. There were uh, several missions. With every mission, the camera system improved uh, from key age uh, one to uh, key age nine. Uh, the one to four mission operated between the 60, 1960 and 1972. The images are declassified since 1995. Not all of them are archived as far as I remember, but you can get it. If there's something is not archived, you can ask, you can ask the USGS to archive it for you for a, for a low fee. And uh, why is it ingenious? Well, first of all, like uh, just uh, let's, uh, uh just the way the film was uh, intercepted from the satellite is uh, already very interesting so the satellite flies and then at some point they trigger that uh, the film detaches from the satellite so it re-enters the air it's like follows a uh, trajectory and then, then there's an aircraft that actually captures this film mid-air i think it's pretty insane to believe that it actually worked and it worked in the 60s now, on top of that, they would always release the film when they were flying over the uh, sea so that if the aircraft does not capture the film, it flows, it, 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 uh, it uh, sinks in the, in the ocean and cannot be uh, taken by the, uh, by the enemy. So yeah, it's a, it's a very good story, I find. Uh, but there are re other reasons why people are interested in uh, the corona. And first of all, it's because of this coverage. Huh? Corona covers, and these are maps for keyhole for uh, a, um, a and B only. So you see that uh, the coverage is worldwide with obviously the former Soviet Union being the red point. So where most of the captures uh, took place. Uh, and because we go back to the 60s, as it's a, we, we have a pre lancer record of, of different phenomena. So it's very interesting for uh, environmental applications. And there has been uh, quite some research done uh, on that, uh, uh, using corona images for land cover change detection, glacier mass balance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm not delving into that. Uh, I just want to signal that there's a lot of literature if you're interested uh, to to go through. Um, what I find very interesting in the, of the camera is the design. Uh, it's uh, it's it's very clever. So this is the design of the KH4. And from KH4, we have uh, two cameras. Uh, which oscillate in the opposite directions for the stability of the carrier platform, right? And uh, it's a, a panoramic head. Well, either are a panoramic head. And you see the gray film is a, is a film, it's a panoramic film. And the sensor, the sensor, the camera scans the panoramic film uh, going from left to right. When it arrives at the end of the scan, instead of going back, the camera will do a first full circle, so 360 degree uh, rotation to come back to the beginning. And again, they decided not to do the back and forth and do the 360 degree for the very same reason, stability of the career platform. Um, and what are the consequences of the fact that uh, the image is scanned or well, the beginning of the film is captured at a different time than the end because the 
satellite obviously has moved in, in, in between, right? So this is captured, the beginning is captured with a different perspective center than the end. Uh, it's a bit like, like a push from camera, for instance, right? Um, and what uh, the inventors of the uh, corona uh, came up with was to install an image motion compensation, which probably you all know from modern, from modern camera platforms. There's an image motion compensation system installed, which counteracts the movement of the satellite right? to, uh, yeah, to, to compensate for it, to make as if it did not exist. So the cameras undergo two continuous, uh, simultaneous mo movements uh, while uh, capturing uh, the scene. Um, the swaths are very large, yeah, 200 kilometers by 16, 16 kilometers, like, so huge. And in the middle, uh, in the, the most the most nadir point uh, of the image, you have a resolution up to 1.8 meters. And at the end, at the edges, because of the perspective, uh, you have a, a larger uh, ground sampling distance around seven, eight meters. Uh, you know, this is a zoom on the two movements that the camera undergoes, uh, which makes it a very interesting, but also difficult to process a uh, camera. So you have the scan, which goes from, yeah, from left to right. Okay, and as the as the as the scan uh, progresses, we also have this movement that counteracts the movement of the platform. Right, so this is the flight direction, and the image motion composition goes back. Yeah? It counteracts it, uh, whereas the scan obviously is perpendicular to the flight direction. So these two compound. Uh, movements uh, happen. Obviously, the image motion composition can never compensate exactly for the movement of the platform. So we have still some residual errors present in the images that we have to uh, we have to model. Um, right. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we have this. Uh, Compared to a classical frame camera, we have the panoramic mapping and the fact that the, the mapping is done on a cylinder. This introduces distortion. Uh, what if the cylinder is not perfectly cylindrical? You have scan positional distortion. So uh, due to the fact that the camera moves as the scan is going on, IMC, image motion compensation, physical film distortions as well, and obviously film digitization introduces artifacts. So yeah, just to say, like, there's a lot going on and uh, this is one of the reasons why uh, I think it's even more underexploited than aerial, uh, aerial historical images, uh, because implementing and finding these parameters is very difficult, and you have no a priori about them. Um, so you have to, do, you have to, you have to, you have to guess them. Uh, there are different methods in the literature to model these kind of cameras where you're going from less rigorous to more rigorous uh, or collinearity equations. Obviously, it doesn't, well, you can do collinearity equation only in a patch of a corona image, but uh, yeah, uh, why, why can't you? Because you have this time components that uh, collinearity equations alone do not model. You can do second order polynomials, RPCs, or the appropriate model that is time dependent collinearity equation. Um, well, whatever the model, uh, what we saw at least at the time of that research, uh, the reported accuracy were around tens of meters. Also, not uh, great, but yeah, depends on the applications you're 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 interested in. Yeah, maybe it's enough. Uh, so when we when I started working with Corona, I was in tectonics, and we were very ambitious. Uh, we were looking at uh, what the geologists. I'm not a geologist, so forgive me if I don't use the right terms, uh, but. Sorry, as I understand, we were looking at the creep movement of two tectonic plates, right, which is marked, uh, the, 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 the fold, if you will, is marked with, with blue here. Yeah? So we have two tectonic plates that move the opposite direction, but a very small pace, slow pace, but steadily yeah, across uh, tens of years. And the particular movement in Balochistan that interested my colleagues at uh, the Institute of Physics uh, was one centimeter or two centimeters per year. So we were looking at displacements that were 50 centimeters, extremely ambitious, but we still, we decided to try. Uh, first question we asked ourselves was, well, which mathematical model we use, uh, given that we had, we were constrained by time because that was done at the end of a PhD. Uh, so we had maybe four months uh, to do all that. 
uh, we knew we wouldn't have time to implement probably the, 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 the proper mathematical model, which is the time collinearity equation. So we thought, well, let's 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 see what what we can do with what we have in house. And what we had in in house, and and we thought resembled a lot the physical model of a cam of of the corona was a Fisher camera. Uh, so for, we found it interesting to try Fisher Fisher camera model because nobody has done it. And uh, well, we saw we saw the resemblance between between the two. So on the left hand side, you have the uh, spherical uh, fisheye camera projection, right? So you have uh, you have a you have a curvature in in both x and y of the image, right? And on the right hand side, you have the corona panoramic camera model. So you have the curvature, the cylindrical curvature along along one direction. You have nothing. You have orthogonal projection. Uh, along along the other uh, uh, direction, along the y, right? So the difference here is that the fisheye would introduce additional distortions along our y-axis, right? But we said corona images are so thin and so long, but right? maybe maybe it would maybe it could work, and maybe if there's some residual distortion left, we could correct it with uh, uh, distortion uh, coefficients, like uh, maybe radial or or, or dissentric. Uh, distortion. Uh, so that was our reasoning. And uh, once we decided on the model, we had to uh, find a protocol to georeference uh, the camera, right? So to find the focal length, the principal point, and also the external orientation. Uh, and to do that, we picked, we did not pick the zone in Balochistan because it has moved over time and we were going to use uh, modern satellite images to georeference it. So because there was a movement, we could not, we, we could not use it as a, as a georeferencing because we would, jeffer, we would georeference our corona images that were captured in the 60s with respect to the situation that we have uh, over Balochistan today. Yeah, so it doesn't make sense. So we would have to have images from the 60s too georeference these images. So we, we picked another uh, acquisition that was very, it was obviously acquired during the same mission. It was not, uh, 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 it was a close orbit, I believe. And we picked Chad because it was a state, tectonically stable area. So we, we could assume that nothing has changed between this uh, 50 year gap or 60 year gap. And uh, we picked it because there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of uh, height differences. So it was a very uh, mountainous area, and it's important for estimating focal length uh, because focal length is is, uh, is perfectly correlated with the flying height of your of your camera. And uh, if it was a flat surface, like we would never be able to to estimate it. So adding 3D in your scene helps helps the estimation process. So that was that was the reasoning. And so here you say five, you see five spot pairs over one footprint of corona images. It makes you realize how how big the corona uh, footprint is. Um, and, and here you can see the profile of the uh, surface in, in chat in our area used for calibration. So what was the pipeline to calibrate it? Well, we first recovered the, uh, the fisheye model, but you can use any off-the-shelf SFM to recover the fisheye uh, answers of your uh, or how good that how good fisheye and approximation can be for the corona. Uh, and so we did that using wave parallax. If you have, if we have photogrammetrists in the in the room, you know what I'm talking about. I assume not many photogrammetrists are, are there, so I'll just briefly explain what is a wave parallax. So ideally, if you have two images and they are perfectly orientated one with respect to another, if you pick a point in one image, you reconstruct a bundle with interior orientation corresponding to that point, and you project this line to another image, right? The, the projections will fall perfectly on the points that are corresponding to, the, to this point on the uh, left image. This never happens. In reality, we always have some sort of errors around no more systematic uh, in our external orientation and interior orientation that serve to do these projections. So the real homologous points are a bit off that line. So what we did is we estimated how off are we from the epipolar line. And this is a proxy to see, uh, to say how, how good our uh, orientations are. Okay. And this is the image. This is the Y parallax. 
calculated pair in per, per every pixel in uh, in one image of a pair of a stereo pair. So we saw that and we thought, whoa, there's a lot going on. There's a high frequency, there's a high frequency signal and there's a low frequency signal. The uh, high frequency signal are these jumps, right? We have vertical and horizontal jumps. And then we have low frequency signal, which is the, for example, this, this uh, spot here or that spot. And we thought, well, these spots, low frequency signal could be, could be caused by, or could come from, from the fact that we use a Fisher model, but these discontinuities is not our fault. This definitely, well, we suspect that it comes from the scanning procedure uh, of the Corona film. It's just a default, uh, 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 yeah. It's just this case. This is a scanning machine. Basically, had it has some sort of had some had some e some sort of issue and introduced uh, these errors in our uh, scanned images. So we knew that we had to remove these jumps if we want to proceed because the jumps were very high. They were like they had an amplitude of six pixels, right? So if we multiply six pixels by two meters, which is the resolution, and then add your most uh, uh, area of the image where well, we have like almost 20 meters so um, we are searching for 50 centimeters the uh, movement so yeah we had we had to do something about it i'm not explaining now how we did it because it's very it's it's quite involved and i don't think it's so interesting but we basically identified the uh, jumps in our images we measured uh, the uh, value of the jumps what was the jump and then we applied we resampled our images uh, in order to compensate for these jumps, right? to, to remove them. So once we did that, we removed, uh, what well, we hoped we removed uh, at least in part uh, the uh, discontinuous signal. We went back to uh, the first uh, step, which is we recovered the geometry again, but now with the corrected images, right? And if everything went well, we would have, we will see, uh, and if we compute the Y parallax, so the systematic errors again, we will see that uh, our residuals are, uh, have gone, have diminished. And this is indeed what we, what we saw. So on the left-hand side, you can see the, um, the artifacts before correction. And, and this is what we obtained after correction. We effectively removed 70% of, uh, of the error's amplitude. Yeah? So from six pixels, we went to more or less two pixels. So we were happy with that. You can still see some residual errors, but yeah, uh, I think uh, we were quite satisfied with that. And I knew, we knew we wouldn't be able to do better. Um, so then we generated uh, what we found, these spot images, we uh, made sure the orientations were fine, uh, we generated DSMs, this is not necessary, but generating DSM uh, helped us to exploit some single image observations. So, so if we then found common points between historical images and spot images and there were single image observations, uh, we could still intersect these single image observations with our DSMs and, and use them as uh, ground control points, for instance. Um, so once we had the two epochs, let's say, in hands, we, we were ready to uh, find common features between them to georeference uh, Corona with respect to spot. Uh, SIFT, unsurprisingly, didn't work. Uh, so what we did, well, if, as a photogrammetrist, uh, like I, every now and then I have to do manual control points measurements. So we did that. Uh, we found 30, around 27 uh, control points. We divided into two groups. We used one group of control points to perform the bundle adjustment estimation. And uh, the other group we used for uh, for a check for for checking the, the accuracy. Um, so yeah, with the manual, actually, so first with the manual GCPs, we performed the 3D similarity transformation, and that gave us a rough georeferencing. And I must now say, uh, you might find it confusing because you may ask yourself, why did I not apply my uh, hist aerial, uh, aerial historical pipeline? Because this happened before that. If we didn't have the historical aerial pipeline in place, probably it could, it could work on corona images too, but we didn't try. Um, once we had a rough core registration, we had to find automated GCPs, and we did that through dense matching. This is not very interesting, given that, yeah, it's... Uh, Again, probably we could replace the point one and point two with uh, the aerial historical pipeline. These are the uh, automated points that were found by dense matching and actually, yeah, dense matching and then uh, uh, picking the most stable points using a correlation image. Uh, 
the points are much denser. Uh, there are still some patches where there are no points, but uh, yeah, it's 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 not to 20 points. Eh? Maybe it's uh, 200 points. So at that time, we were satisfied. We performed a bundle adjustment, we refined our cameras, and we used our 12 uh, control points to see how accurate we are. And we saw 16, 17, 12 meters huh? uh, while we were looking for 50 centimeter movement. Uh, so we understood that we weren't, uh, we weren't there. Uh, we would have to work uh, harder. Uh, this said, just this this is an absolute uh, absolute precision or accuracy, right? With respect to some absolute corner frame, uh, this does not does not mean that you cannot generate a surface from a corona stereo pair. No, because relatively the corona stereo pairs they were uh, well re co-registered. It's with respect to an absolute frame uh, that they weren't well co-registered. So. You, you could use them and, and, and create a, an eye-pleasing DSM. Uh, obviously, if you compare this DSM with, some, with an ESR, SRTM or with uh, another global DEM, if you computed the difference, you would have seen that there are artifacts due to the fact that the geometry is not well modeled. But without doing this comparison, you'd be very happy uh, to see uh, the surface that is, is quite nice. Right, okay, so take away, uh, I have still time. Oh, it's 55, so I have to hurry up. Uh, take away from that part, uh, we came up with a protocol to remove these. Well, first of all, we identified the scanning artifacts and then we came up with a protocol to remove them. 70% of them could be removed. Uh, Fisher model turned out to be just an approximation of the physical camera model of, of Corona, but it was good enough to serve as an a priori to find automated points. So we were happy with uh, uh, with with the idea. Uh, for our case study, detection movements below one meter, obviously we uh, were stuck. Uh, we 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 had to go further and uh, implement a rigorous camera model. Unfortunately, our PhD student left. So we stopped working on it. But something very, I was very lucky. A year and a half later, Sajid Gufar, my former colleague, approached me and said that he was going to work on corona images. And he was ready to implement the camera model, the rigorous camera model. Uh, in the meantime, a year and a half, new powerful extraction algorithms uh, came up. Uh, so we didn't have to go through all this uh, dense matching to find points, et cetera. Third, Sajid had a much less ambitious goal. He wasn't looking for 50 centimeters uh, movements. He was looking for long-term glacial volume change. So we're not, it's not the same order of magnitude of uh, uh, movements. And he also had more time. And uh, so he did that. Uh, he implemented a rigorous camera during his postdoc at uh, Central Andrew University. Uh, all these puzzles taken into account with a magic one from Sajid. A cost corona stereo pipeline uh, uh, was born, which is a tool that is capable of uh, doing large scale processing uh, on corona images uh, by implementing the uh, rigorous camera model. Very uh, shortly, I really want to uh, go through that part because it's it's uh, it's beautiful work that Sajid did, and I was very lucky to be involved in it. Uh, key ingredients of cost: first, as I said panoramic camera model, so uh, the rigorous camera model. And Sajid had the courage to go search for uh, camera calibration metrics to try to understand uh, how uh, to remove this bending distortion from the camera. So he, he basically, well, he, he understood, he found some metrics that were saying uh, that exposed during the picture taking uh, rail holes on the image. He, 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 identified these rail, hole, rail holes in the, the, the images. And he knew that these rail holes should be uh, straight lines, but they weren't straight lines. Yeah? He, he, actually straight, he actually traced these uh, rail holes in the images and he saw that we have like extreme uh, deviations from a straight line, straight line up to 100 pixels, right? So what he did, well, he decided to resample his image to make it, to make it straight. And just by doing that, uh, he, well, maybe first, just by implementing the rigorous camera model, look, his uh, accuracies, he, he basically halved what we had, especially in the, uh, the planimetry. 
he halved what we were obtaining with our Fisher camera model. And then by applying on top of that, this uh, bending correction of the film, he further halved uh, his, especially in the Z, uh, he halved his uh, precision, right? So this is yeah, an imp important uh, point. Uh, camera calibration, bending distortion, uh, apply both to uh, increase your precision in 3D. Then, as I said, there were the feature points. And he, uh, Sajid, used uh, Planescope or Landsat 7 to find the X and Y coordinates, uh, absolute X and Y coordinates. And then he used the SRTM or ALOS for uh, uh, retrieving the third coordinates. Uh, you can see that these points are extremely dense, uh, except for maybe where there's no uh, contrast in the middle. Um, Finally, uh, with the points, with the correction, and with the rigorous camera model, this is the DOD that Sajid obtained when comparing his DEM with an SRTM. And you can see that it's not perfect. He was unhappy with the uh, systematical errors at the end. So he came up with a solution, which was a 3D fine, a fine transformation to remove that. And this is his final result. Huh? So now, uh, a nice DOD that shows only the differences, um, hopefully, that correspond to uh, true changes in uh, in the landscape. And he went even further because he adopted COSP to large scale mapping. Uh, he picked uh, 12 uh, consecutive uh, stereo pairs of Corona and he uh, put them together, ran a bundle adjustment and obtained this uh, large scale map of uh, in central Pamir. Uh, of the changes in the, the glaciers. So, teaser, and I'm really, I'm really done. Uh, Sajid just released a very nice paper that I want you to uh, have a look at. He applied COSP on, on a Keyhole 9 camera. Keyhole 9 camera is, the difference between Keyhole 9 and Keyhole 4 is in resolution principally. Uh, there are other differences, but this is the most uh, important difference. Look at the images, uh, Keyhole 9, and compare it with Playad. We can see the same level of detail. Right, so we, we have 60 centimeter resolution. Huh? It's a resolution that is uh, superior to spot six. Huh? Uh, it's it's uh, it's a unique uh, piece of data they classified in 2011, and the paper just came out. Uh, go have a look at it and speak to Sajid if you have any questions. Huh? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I know I'm I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll speed this. Uh, um, take away from the corona part. Uh, so time dependent coloniality questions are a must uh, for uh, precision mapping with, with corona, something that I said. Uh, automation is not possible. So corona images can be automated fully or at least semi-automated, uh, uh, semi-automated. Uh, semi and there's still room for, for improvement. As you see at the end, you can still see still some uh, residual errors that are corrected with a post-processing 3D affine transformation. Ideally, this should be corrected for already in the bundle adjustments. So you might, uh, or Sajid probably is considering to uh, include camera distortions to compensate for that. Uh, thank you. And sorry for taking so long. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for your great presentation. Mostly, I'm not very experienced in the uh, subject of uh, photogrammetry, but these studies are very interesting and it includes uh, many diverse studies in general, very unique from those done in uh, remote sensing, in the field of remote sensing, I would say. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Is there any question from the participants? You can unmute yourself if you have any question or you can just type uh, on the chat uh, so that we can read your uh, questions. So actually I have uh, one question. Uh, as I said before, the, 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 all the, you know, most of the topics you uh, explained here are not very much related to what I'm doing, but uh, I'm, working on the earthquake damage assessment, which uh, strongly relies on what you are doing here, especially when it comes to uh, comparing uh, pre and post earthquake images. Right. Uh, we had a very, um, I mean, uh, a large earthquake in Turkey, probably you may have heard of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are trying to uh, somehow uh, map the the uh, the damages uh, in the structures or in the roads uh, using the pre and post earthquake images. So the thing is, um, when comparing the those two images, we uh, there are many challenges. Uh, you 
you know that, right? So especially when the images uh, comes with the different resolution and different uh, angles, which makes the, the whole process even more challenging. So uh, what do you recommend? I mean, the, first of all, the, the code registration of those images are really so important to be able to provide, uh, provide an accurate damage map. So in case you have this kind of different data set, even the, the, the images are acquired from the, the same sensors, uh, they might uh, you know, be different than each other, like the, the variation of the angles or the, the weather, and then the, there are many. you know. So what would you recommend us is in terms of a, an accurate core registration? So you also mentioned in your pre presentation that automatic core registration is not uh, possible right now. I mean, what would you recommend in case of you know comparing the both the pre and post earthquake images, especially in terms of core registration? Yeah, so it's a uh, it's 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 a tough question because uh, I I what I learned uh, while working with historical images that it's very case dependent. Uh, it's very data set dependent. There's no one recipe that would work uh, for everywhere. Um, and as, as far as I can understand, you're, you're not necessarily talking about historical images. No, no, uh, just the, the pre and the post earthquake the images. Post, yeah. Here, our aim is to make a good, I mean, accurate core registration for, right. to, for the two images. Yeah, well, something that is, is certainly very important is to, uh, while co-registering, you should be able to, yeah, it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, you should eliminate the areas that have changed, right? right. Because while, while you co-register, you're actually making an implicit uh, assumption that the scene has, is the same, right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I think... Uh, yeah, but the task is uh, so. Yeah, so what we, for instance, do with the earthquake, with the earthquakes, we we mask uh, points that were found. We more or less we are always able to identify it, identify the fault. Mm -hmm. uh, we um, we are never in urban areas. Most of the time, we are uh, looking at uh, 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 rural areas. Uh, mm -hmm. So this this is it's it, and we we might we might have. Uh, uh, radar data that it comes additionally and uh, it's yeah there are means to identify where more or less the earthquake took place and we can just remove these points from processing. Um, for your case I think uh, because you said Turkey so I'm like so I'm, somehow I have these images in my mind where it's in the city probably urban area and so on and so forth. Yes, huh? yes, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I know. I don't know. I I think uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because I mean, um, yeah. After the earthquake, the the, the destroy. I mean, the many buildings are collapsed. So finding and control points it becomes also very challenging. So this is also another issue uh, for the core registration. Yeah. So well, what you well, if you use if you use. Uh, uh, satellite images actually the core registration should be good like you should you, there's no need to perform any further core registration if you use satellite images okay yeah, okay mm -hmm. or yeah. if you have an area of flight that is uh that has a direct geo referencing so it has a gps sure. and, that's yeah. right yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so you, you can make this hypothesis that uh there is no and actually i'm like as i'm talking to you i'm, I'm because micmac was used to actually do uh mapping of the uh, turkish uh, uh, earthquake uh, fault. In, I'm trying to find this link because there's an article written, but I can't. Maybe I'll just publish on my Twitter if anyone is interested. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Is there any question uh, from the participants? Uh, if there is no, is there? Let me check the chat box. You can unmute yourself if you have any questions. Otherwise, uh, I will. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Vivelina, um, and you for a nice coordinating presentation. Uh, so um, uh, I did uh, this uh, historical aerial photograph processing for area of uh, 5,370 square kilometers. That is for um, uh, different applications. Uh, 
So really it took to me for, I mean, Eveli Nanos, it took to me around more than one year to process, you know, especially uh, when you are new, just you might face such a kind of uh, time in finding GCP, something like that. Uh, the aerial photographs were uh, captured on 1967 by uh, US Department of Defense and in 1984. So I wanted to uh, somehow, there are especially areas, uh, uh, there is uh, what we call, there is excavation, you know? So uh, currently uh, I couldn't use drone or other area to, uh, you know, map the volume. There is a query site. So can I use uh, total station just to see volumetric change? Because in the area, just I, can't, I couldn't use drone and other current aerial photographs. So what will you say? So you, you're suggesting to, so you want to map the area today? And you're asking if you could do it with the portal station? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, just uh, the dim and ortho photo for the 1967 and 1984, it's already generated and my yeah. paper is also yeah. under peer review. Uh, and uh, I got to uh, specific areas. Uh, the areas uh, in Ethiopia, uh, there is the second highest uh, mountain called Bali Mountain National Park. Uh -huh. So there are specifically two uh, areas uh, that are used as a query site, you know? So this query site, uh, they use it for uh, gravel road maintenance and other stuff. So I was interested, you know, I know while I was processing this uh, aerial photographs. So for the current one, that is uh, the only possible is to use total station for, you know, pick the points and generate the distal elevation model. So I can use this one or should I use uh, like, uh, yeah, it's okay. I understand now. So, yeah. uh, I, I, well, I, so I, I think it depends on what uh, uh, accuracies and you're uh, aiming at, because the easiest is to use, uh, uh, to find, uh, to, to use that same way Sajid did. Uh, you can use planet scope mosaics, for instance, which are georeferenced. They okay. give you, uh, yeah. Or you can so but yeah the problem is then you have to for the for the for the z coordinate you would have to rely on global DENs which are not they are maybe thirty meters uh, they have a thirty meter grid so it's not perfect uh, yeah so let's say this is not a very precise solution but then you can always you could task an acquisition by uh, uh, by either planet score Playad, world views etc so like use the satellite images you then you don't have to go. Uh, in uh, on site and to do the measurements, but uh, uh, you can obtain uh, the 3D from images, satellite images, uh, by just ordering them. Yeah, just I was actually um, sending an email to uh, European Space Imaging, so their minimum uh, area extent is, uh, I think, around 100 square kilometers, so which is a bit, uh, you know, um, expensive. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, also, I generated. Uh, what's the resolution of your historical images? Because uh, uh, it is zero point eight uh, four meter for nineteen eighty four and zero point nine eight for ninety six some something like that. Okay. So below it is uh, yeah. yeah below one meter. So I actually yeah. I generated both dim and uh, ortho photo for both years, and uh, as a second paper, I wanted to to the volumetric change analysis for this mm -hmm. two specific sites. Yeah. Uh, well, so this, this uh, so first of all, for GCPs, you don't need to have, you don't need to order uh, satellite images that cover the entire area. Yeah, for GCP, you don't need to have the GCPs everywhere. Uh, you can yeah. just pick uh, zones, maybe nicely distributed. Uh, yeah. so this will produce definitely a cost. Uh, and then number two is the uh, same, this, the, your object of interest, 
it's not the entire 100 uh, square kilometers, right? It's a, it's a, yeah, it's, it's um, a query. So you just take, yeah. you order a pair of images that cover this area, and I think it will be no. Mm, okay, that's what like on top of my head. That's what. Yeah, I thank you. Doing. Really, just I was happy, so I you know. <laughs> don't hesitate to drop me a line if you want to continue the discussion. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm happy. Thank, thank you, Mohamed. For your question, another question. There is one question on the chat box, Evelina, if you want to uh, read the question, but it's not very clear. Uh, sure, uh, chat, mm -hmm. uh, right. Angus, uh, Angus Al Almerio. Uh, okay. Angus. Um, hard. How hard will it be? How hard will it be with urban areas with a lot of human intervention? uh to register images uh, historical images it is it's a uh, urban areas were the hardest for us for instance huh? oh in general uh, vegetated areas and urban areas are the more difficult the most difficult uh but urban areas that change a lot right uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, it's it's, uh, it's all it's all i can say and everything it depends on the on the case uh, if you take if you have image if you're lucky to have a very uh, nice uh, temporal frequency of your acquisition and not so much has changed in between the acquisition then i think yeah you you can perform long term analysis by by uh, what decomposing the beginning and an end into uh, several uh, steps uh, but if you have 50 years of difference like i presented here well you you may not be able to do that mm -hmm. in an automated way wow. You can okay. always pick up ground control points uh, yourself. Yeah. I know. Okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Um, check the box. I think we covered all the questions. So, right. All right. So, um, after completing the part uh, for the technical question related to your work, I would like to continue with the part uh, which uh, includes just two questions related to your experiences um, sure. and uh, in your career development. Uh, yeah. Let me ask my first question. Uh, I wonder uh, what motivated you to pursue a career in science and also why do you choose this specific area to work on? Oh, okay. Um... So uh, it wasn't very obvious uh, for me. I, I was not a, the kind of kid that uh, always knew they wanted to be in, in, in science. Uh, there are no scientists in my family, so I didn't have uh, uh, close uh, role models for that. I think the first time I thought of uh, uh, becoming or pursuing a scientific career was uh, my master supervisor proposed it to me. Uh, he proposed that I uh, continue with it after my master's to continue uh, with a PhD. And it, uh, uh, yeah, he, that was a, that was a grain that started uh, started it all. And now when I retrospectively think of my career, I think I, it's, it's a perfect, uh, it's an ideal career for me. I get to learn a lot. Every day is different. Uh, you have, you, you you face new challenges regularly uh all all, all that i like and all that uh, a researcher's life uh, uh helps you helps you to do um yeah I, so I i i always i knew that research was also connected with uh traveling and meeting new people something that uh, mm -hmm. i enjoy doing it's actually a must for a researcher to expose yourself to very many different ideas many different uh, environments so uh yeah i didn't have a particular inspiration i would say but uh, in retrospect um, i'm happy to have taken this path yeah that's that's the most important part if you're happy so you're in the right place right <laughs> <laughs> all right so the, my sec second question is do you think having a role model is crucial in the field of science is there someone who particularly inspires you you mentioned that your master uh Professor, yeah, gosh, um, yeah. I think uh, we have role models are very are extremely important, huh? uh, and yeah, I, I'd say uh, 
Yeah, every time like I see, for instance, a successful woman, whether a scientist or not, I, I see what it does to me. It gives me extra confidence. It gives me extra boost uh, to strive and to continue in my uh, in my career. Uh, and so I think that actually to make it about women, I think women representation is very important because it also introduces diversity to the table. And yeah. It, yeah, it breaks the stereotypes and norms that are not uh, that are set by only half of the half of the people. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to my role models, I don't think I had particular role models really, uh, but I met many interesting people all along the way, uh, starting with uh, uh, my colleagues in Vienna and Robert Pfeiffer, uh, uh, and uh, then in Trento, uh, Fabio Ramondino in France. I think. I was very lucky to always work uh, with, close with people who are very, who are very inspirational. I, I like to think that I am myself today, a puzzle, a composition of all these, uh, of all these people, of these, all, of, of all these meetings. Um, I guess if I had to point to one person, I would have to say, uh, I would have to say Marc Pierre de Seligny, my colleague, uh, who is who devoted his career to open source and uh, open source software Micmac, uh, who actually brought me to France as an open source uh, software. I, I came to France to work on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it keeps me in science until today, I believe. It's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I learned photogrammetry by going through source code of Micmac. It, it, I learned so much from it. And mm -hmm. I'm so happy to be part of it, to be able to share with others, to yeah. see that other people find useful what you're doing, that it actually works, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, definitely. It's something uh, to open source and my activity around that uh, is definitely something that is my main driver for research uh, for the last seven years, I would say. Yeah, in science, I mean, open so if you're uh, dealing with the science, it's so meaningful uh, to share your ideas and also your code. So in that sense, open science, I mean, open source coding is really, really so important. And mm -hmm. also, I mean, seeing people like women around uh, makes you so encouraging and happy. And that's why it's really so important. Uh, I mean, the idea of uh, gender equality. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, organizing this kind of webinars, our aim, yeah, I mean, is to uh, somehow uh, make the women researchers visible in this community so that the others can encourage from them. So yeah. thank you again. It, it's, it has been a great and a very interesting, interesting webinar. And thank you for your contribution, Evelina. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And I would like to also thank everyone who participated this webinar. Uh, so with this, I think if you have question, you can ask. Uh, it it doesn't have to be technical. Uh, so, all right. If you don't, uh, I would like to thank everyone again, and you, Evelina, and I. Uh, I'm going to close the webinar, and I hope to see you in in uh, our upcoming uh, webinars, which will be announced through our social media accounts. Before closing, happy uh, International Women's Day. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Gulsan and Evelina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's keep in contact. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.